Well, hello. Hi. Uh, back in a positively balmy London where the temperature today is about four degrees. And if you compare that with minus 17 last week, Stuart, I'll tell you what the uh, sacrifices that one makes in the interests of the Biz News Premium community. But uh, <laughs> thanks to everybody for being here today. Uh, this is a special uh, feedback for the Biz News Premium community. I will be in South Africa next month. Uh, lots of bookings uh, for the events that we're holding with Standard Bank and with the Maritzburg Chamber. So if you're in uh, Maritzburg, I suggest you try and get yourself a ticket pretty quickly because that's filling up there. Also in the country, though, there are still um, events or seats available. But Stuart, we've got a special guest and uh, we also need to go through a few technicals. Thanks, Alec. I said twice in, the, in two days. I feel quite special with these webinars. It's quite nice to have. Um, but just quickly, on the, we, there's a little high five button on your screen there. If you can just click that, if you can hear Alec Kelly and myself, uh, if you can hear us, is, you can just give us that as a sign that we are coming through, okay? Okay, excellent. We've got those coming through. And obviously, and we do like to keep these webinars conversational and sort of interactive. And there's little questions drop down menu on the control panel on the right hand side. If you write the questions in there, I'll sort of pop them to Alec. And obviously, Alec mentioned we've got a special guest. Um, with us is Oliver Kam. He's the head of strategic communication at the World Economic Forum. So, Alec, uh, Oli, great to have you with us. Thank you. Th th thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Alec. Thanks for uh, inviting me. And um, greetings from a possibly sunny, uh, yet not warm or balmy Geneva. It's, uh, it's hovering around zero. So, um, a welcome respite from the chill of Davos, but uh, not quite as exotic as London, I'm afraid to say. Um, I can't hear you, so I'm just going to talk, and I hope that's okay. So do apologies if um, if you're waving at me to stop. I th think for me, um, and just in, in, for the benefit of giving you our insights as the organisers of this annual meeting, of course, it's not a conference, it's an annual meeting, it's a working meeting. So with over 100, 350 sessions, 150 of which are, are, are webcasts, it's kind of difficult to make your way around um, the entire meeting and, and much as I've been spending a lot of time this weekend trying to debrief and, and recap with colleagues, um, my, my, my picture is not complete, but I hope to give you as much of a view as possible. I think, you know, the overall kind of headline I would give is that this was an issue-driven meeting, not a personality-driven meeting. It's interesting that we had quite an ambitious theme this year, Globalization 4.0, um, and to give it its full title, colon shaping a, a global architecture in the age of the fourth industrial revolution so what we tried to do is we tried to set about imagining what a new, a new round an inevitable new round of globalization might look like and more importantly how we can make it work um, without the frailties and, and, and failings of, of past rounds of globalization um, and make make it one that is human-centered to use a, a forum term uh, but basically fairer and more prosperous and more equal for everybody. So it was an ambitious an ambitious meeting theme um, and we covered a lot of areas. I think in practical terms you never know how a meeting is going to uh, really really shape up until the meeting actually starts and, and you know who's coming. So for example there were four um, major areas that, that, that I kind of perceived really kind of coming to the fore and talking to um, colleagues in the media and, and participants I, th I, I think these are bearing out. These four issues are climate, technology, inequality, and the global architecture piece, the multilateralism piece that we, we, we were so hoping that we'd get to the bottom or close to the bottom of kind of deciding. I'll just well, give you a couple quite, of points. I'm quite relieved that uh, you've made those <clears throat> points because we didn't share notes before or swap notes before. And that's pretty much uh, what we're going to be looking at in this presentation. Uh, you, you, we have um, Oliver Can, who's Head of Strategic Communications at the World Economic Forum in Geneva. We've got Stuart in Johannesburg and me in London. So uh, it just shows that we have this very international uh, pod, uh, webinar coming to you today. And in fact, very fresh as well, because the uh, World Economic Forum meeting only ended last week. So what I'm going to do now is we'll... I'll go through, I'll take you through the, the highlights, throwing to Ollie from time to time, if he can just kind of fill in some color. And then what we'd like to do uh, throughout this is answer questions. Stuart is in Johannesburg to pick up your questions. But first, Stu, I think we need to make sure that we've got uh, everybody hearing us loud and clear. Yes, Alec, uh, 
Jeff, you can hear, I see there's, there's a lot of hands coming up so that they can hear you very loud and clear, so that's all good. And I'm not sure if you heard just on the questions there. It is on the right-hand control panel. If you put your questions in there, I'll pick them up and throw them to Ollie and Alec. But all good to go, Alec. Fantastic. And just to make sure, as we always do in these webinars, that uh, I am not a cardboard cutout. Uh, there we go. You can see. Mm -hmm. With my uh, <laughs> Stuart, I've got to get a better background uh, than this, uh, this pretty flower uh, wallpaper. But the rented house in London, and as Ollie knows, uh, rented houses in London don't come. <clears throat> that, uh, uh, in other words, you, you're not allowed to. Seriously, seriously, you're not allowed to put a nail in the wall. Um, so that's the story. We can't, I can't even put a nice picture behind me. Anyway, let's get into the um, in, into the presentation now, and just to give you a, a few of those highlights, please. Can you see Stuart? Can you see the presentation on the screen? Is everything technically working? So, Alec, your front page is there, so it's all good. But when you try to do what you try to do now, it's sort of closed up. So I don't know if you just need to go through the pages individually. Did you see the my, uh, uh, when when we do that? Is it not working? Have you got yeah, a so I think, yeah, okay. if you just go down on the presentation in this format, I think it'll be easier. I don't think you can go full screen, I think. Okay, got it. Uh, Microsoft is in our portfolio, so we're going to have to say, hang on, we shareholders <laughs> now. No, come on, fix things up, Microsoft. Anyway, let's uh, let's just get I'm joking. Let's move on to the, uh, the, the first slide here, which is really just to highlight how damn cold it was there. I think it was about uh, minus 17 on a number of the mornings. Uh, Ollie can can give me some insight because he he gets around later at night and earlier in the morning than I do. But I found that the for a South African uh, to be walking around in that kind of temperature is just uh, it's just not fair. It's it's um, it's it's like torture. Um, but I guess. Uh, Ollie, Ollie? It's, it was a mixed bag for us. I'm just going to interject very briefly. Last year, we lost 30 uh, members of our, of our staff out of about 250 because they were they were holed up in, in apartment buildings that were, were closed due to avalanche risks. They were unable to leave the buildings for 48 hours. So um, <laughs> we didn't have that this year. But just to but just to you know just to just to kind of balance things out, we didn't lose two members on the Saturday night before the meeting started. One to a um, a broken ankle. And another one whose wife um, broke her wrist on the ice. So let's know more ice. So a bit of a you know a score draw. Yeah, a, a very good point there because just just uh, anecdotally, what happened with me? My uh, snowshoes uh, decided on day one to come soleless, so I lost the sole. And fortunately, Greg Beadle, who you guys uh, bring over there from Cape Town for your camera pool, he'd brought an extra pair of felskuns, fellies as we call them in South Africa, with this fantastic rubber sole. And he, he said he uses them and they're incredibly good. And I, I put them on and they were, they worked like a dream. Just, uh, Ollie, before we we, uh, we we go more into into the presentation itself, why would Greg be brought from Cape Town all the way to to help you with your um with your picks is is that the way the the world economic forum works in other words you pick out the best from wherever they might be in the world yeah i mean if you have you seen his work he's amazing greg's great um i can't remember how many years it is now but we started working as you know we have regional meetings um and in africa in sub-saharan africa at least that our, our home from home is is cape town where we generally make ourselves present every couple of years so we've been working with greg with greg for a couple of years um, and as simple as this, the, the, we bring the best of all, all the regions to Davos. I think it's his third or fourth Davos now. I, I love the guy. He lent me a scarf last year. He obviously comes well prepared. <laughs> Your scarf to you, shoes for me. <clears throat> so anyway, just to just to take you through these four little picks, which for me kind of epitomize uh, what goes of five little picks, I suppose. There's a screenshot there which shows minus 17. But on the left-hand side, something you've got to get used to when you go to the World Economic Forum meetings is security, very tight security. Not surprising because the people who are there uh, would be, well, high-risk uh, targets for extremists, if you like. Every Everywhere you go, you go through security blocks. Once you Once you in the center, things, of course, ease up very nicely. But uh, you have to be quite calm and patient. And for the most part, people are. The second picture there is 
uh, in the evening. You have some pretty late nights and some pretty early mornings, and there's a lot of darkness. Uh, the, the sun only coming up, as you can see in the third picture there, at around about 8 a.m., uh, but the action begins from, well, depending on where you're staying, you've got to get on the road by 6 a.m. The third thing is, is Davos itself, the, the crane, they're still building in this uh, town, which the very first year I went was in 1993, uh, just before uh, South Africa got its its democracy. And that was, it, it, it was ex ex astonishing this year because many of those who were there in 1993, remember this is pre-democracy in South Africa, were again there this year, but of course in very different positions. Dita Mboweni, who helped me to do a outside broadcast. Those days I had a camera, uh, or I hired a camera crew, and uh, we did an outside broadcast back to the SABC where I was working at the time. Uh, and, and I asked Tito, who was just Tito then, um, to come and help me do a broadcast. Today, of course, Tito Mboweni is the Minister of Finance uh, for South Africa. Ibram Patel was a, a, he worked out of a tiny little office in Cape Town uh, where he was the head of the Clothing and Textile Workers Union. He's now the Minister of Economic Affairs. So it's it's really interesting when you go back uh, to to what kind of a how deep a role this World Economic Forum has played in South African history. Indeed, in 1992, the year before I went there for the first time, uh, it was the very first time that Nelson Mandela, F. W. de Klerk, and uh, Marcos Tshibutulezi uh, shared the same stage. And Davo uh, Davos is credited with changing Mandela from arriving as a man who wanted to nationalize everything that moved to leaving uh, uh, as a man who managed, or certainly under his guidance, the economy to uh, a, a fabulous first few years of democracy until, well, what's happened most recently. We'll talk about that later, though. So there's Davos has just transformed over that period. And it is now, uh, it, I think it's five five-star hotels, uh, something like 80% of the revenue of the hotels are generated in this one week of the World Economic Forum is there. And I think the less said about the rents uh, that they charge, the better. And then finally, on the right-hand side, uh, the Congress Center of the World Economic Forum, which started there in 1971, has become one of the one of the most prestigious in the world. So that's that's a little bit about that. This year, the themes, and, and Oli has given you a little taste of, of the way the WEF saw it. From my perspective, I, I look at three themes. The one uh, on the left-hand side, an unusual uh, reflection of this theme, which is sustainability, is Hendrik de Toy, who's the um, Joint Chief Executive now of Investec. And the reason I put him there was I was at a private breakfast with him where he spoke all about sustainability. I'll give you more insight into that uh, a little bit later. Uh, the second theme for me was South Africa, uh, because Trump wasn't there, because uh, there was, in fact, there wasn't a single a member of the U.S. delegation, and they were supposed to uh, be there in full force, uh, but who was present in Davos. We did get uh, Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, doing a live video crossing, but outside of that, the U.S. officialdom was uh, absent. Of course, U.S. business was not, um, and, so, and that kind of cleared the way with the U.K. having their Brexit issues, with uh, Macron having his yellow jackets issues. It cleared the way for South Africa to to, to get a little higher up the agenda than it might have otherwise, and very, very positive feedback coming from the South African delegation. Uh, it's a year on since uh, Cyril said we are uh, going to be transforming, and and it's being appreciated by the smart money. I'll tell you about that later. And then on the right-hand side uh, is, uh, is a reflection of tech. To me, tech was a, a big theme as well, uh, particularly artificial intelligence. So... Uh, I guess what uh, when when I talk about South Africa, that that would really be aligned with what Oli was saying more about you know, about the world generally, the emerging world getting getting a bit more attention. Moving on to the first of those themes um, now, Oli, tell us, give us some background on that. That's David, Sir David Attenborough. Now, for me, an incredible uh, achievement by the WEF this year was not only to get Sir David Attenborough, and there he's getting the Crystal Award from Mrs. Schwab. Um, which is a highly prestigious thing, a South African who's won that, or two South Africans who won it, Charlie's Tehran and um, uh, Anand Singh. But uh, first of all, you got a David Attenborough to come to divorce, and then you got him interviewed by Prince William. <laughs> How do you set something like that up? Well, um, it's a good question. I mean, I think one thing I just say about that is the fact that 
I think in the past, people, especially the media, when they look at they, when they when they look ahead to a meeting and they're thinking, they're thinking about how what kind of impact it's going to have, and they look at the num you know, the numbers of senior public figures um, coming, and 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 they kind of judge they prejudge the meeting's impact and success on the number of heads of state and government coming. Of course, they're really important, but every year there's always somebody coming out of that field who is has more of an impact than 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 almost anybody. Last year. You probably remember, in fact, Alec, you and I um, shared a, a kind of post briefing with Yuval Hariri, who was absolutely fascinating, um, gave us huge glimpses into the way that technology was changing humanity. Um, and this, the, the real star of the show was, was David Attenborough. And I think this goes back to what I mentioned earlier about this being an issues driven meeting. He would have been speaking on the same day as Donald Trump, um, on the, uh, according to the, the, the original program grid. Now, I'm personally delighted that we were able to give a major stage to, 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 to Lord Attenborough, Sir David, I'm not quite sure where he is now, and, uh, and, and Prince William as well, who I thought did a really, really good job. Um, how do we set it up? Well, it was, um, yeah, we've been completely um, talking, of course, to, to, to Sir David or Lord Attenborough for, for a, a really long period of time. It's very, very closely tied up with the major work we're doing around biodiversity. You'll probably also notice that Netflix released a, launched a, um, a series on the subject around the same time, and I think even premiered in Davos. Um, so we've been kind of working and coordinating that for a long time. And the Prince, of course, he's also very keen on other issues. So the other major session he was involved in was mental health, um, which I was looking at the numbers for our media uh, performance um, this morning, in fact, when I came, came into the office. And mental health was actually the eighth um, most prominent issue that was discussed during the whole week. So, you know, it's really a matter of getting most interesting people from, you know, to represent issues that we, we know are important, but we just need a greater mass of to, to bring them alive. The whole story of health was something uh, that, that I also focused a lot of attention on. I had uh, two incredible interviews, Oli, thanks to your guys at the forum in inviting these amazing people two of the of the leading science uh, scientists in aging in in the whole uh, research that's been done in in that field as well so it it really is maybe maybe you can just tell us how do you decide who you invite for instance there's dame uh, linda partridge who is one of the preeminent scientists in ageism how, how would you have found someone like her to bring her to the annual meeting uh well, we have we have a like a like a good football club has a uh, has a or a cricket club has a, has a has a kind of network of, of of kind of feeder events or or teams. You know, if I'm Manchester United, I'll probably have my favourite club in Belgium where I go scouting for talent, etc., etc. Um, we get ourselves out all over the world um, during the year, but we also have we also have communities. You know, and I, and I like to think of Davos as a bit like the Olympics. It's not just one tournament or one getting you know get together. It is a meeting of um, the food security community, or the health community, or the uh, the renewable in, in energy community. Just in the same way that you know, Greek Roman wrestling and swimming and athletics come together at the Olympics. So we have really dynamic, active um, communities throughout the year. We have, and I'm not sure if you've been to join us um, for this meeting, Alec, but we have a really fascinating brainstorm in November called the Global Future summit where we basically get 700 experts generally academics um, sometimes chief strategy officers um, sometimes former public figures people like uh, Carl Bildt or, or Gordon Brown um, and we lock them up for two days in a, in a very nice building in, in Dubai and we we kind of throw away the key and so they come out with lots of good ideas that is the basis of Davos for us and the programming we kind of use that meeting to determine where we want to focus on in three months later when we all get some get, get together and meet up and after that, I think we've got a good idea of who we want to uh, to bring to to talk to us and, and help raise those issues. Well, we really are privileged to have you uh, with us this morning. Thanks, Oli, for for joining us and giving us this inside track. Uh, and as you can see, Stu has put up uh, links to the interview with Hendrik Toy and uh, Toy, and a link uh, to the interview with Dame Linda Partridge. Uh, in fact, I think this year uh, the interviews that I did were. And and I, I think this is my sixteenth time that I've attended. Were the best that I've had. There are some incredible interviews. Of course, uh, one very timeless that you might want to listen to after this uh, webinar is the one that I had with uh, Maria Ramos, who this morning has resigned as or is retiring as the 
chief executive of APSA, and I've got a feeling she's going to go into public sector service. It's almost like uh, when Cyril Ramaphosa winks and says, uh, uh, people uh, drop everything that they're doing, including yeah. even running the Africa's biggest retail bank and, and, and get their shoulder to the wheel. Talk about that in a minute, though. But just before we move off the, the subject of sustainability, one of the uh, issues, well, there were many issues that uh, Sir David Attenborough um, addressed, and I, I agree with Oli that it was a fabulous uh, interview by um, Prince William. Um, what's he called, Oli? The Duke of Cambridge, isn't it? Uh, Duke of Cambridge. Duke of Cambridge. And it's, and it's Sir David, not Lord Attenborough. I've just checked. Ah, Sir David, right. Uh, and and Sir David and the Duke of Cambridge to give them their full titles, but they were just splendid. And the uh, it, it was the very first uh, event on the opening day in the plenary session and, uh, and, and followed by the uh, president of Brazil, the newly elected president of Brazil, Bolsonaro, uh, giving his first international address. Uh, so you can imagine that's the caliber of of uh, fear uh, that that one gets exposed to in Davos. But the, the important thing there about sustainability was the, the uh, from an African connection, Sir David said that his eyes were opened in the 1950s when he visited Africa for the first time. It was before there were pesticides and he said it was just incredible how many species uh, were there, particularly bugs, which uh, have been wiped out now by uh, mankind. And uh, he, he said it, it, it really saddens him to see how uh, we as a, as a species have, have been killing other species. But he said it's, he remains optimistic because there is a greater focus now and appreciation now by the whole world on what is going on with the natural kingdom. And it was, it was interesting. I, I never heard uh, anybody refer to our good pal Lewis Pugh, who incidentally, those who, those of you in South Africa who haven't been following the news um, uh, in, in the UK would, would probably not even know, but he has now not swum across the English Channel, he's swum along the length of the English Channel. So not enough for, for Lewis uh, just to do a normal old channel crossing. He's done the, the whole length, I think it took him two weeks or something, but he was on Sky News every night. And Lewis has dedicated his life, as you are well aware, to cleaning up the oceans, and particularly of late, plastics in the oceans. Now that's gone mainstream, and you heard that being referred to in many uh, instances in Davos this year, the, the problem of plastics and what it's doing to mar marine life. And that's really what David Attenborough was saying. Not long ago, people were not paying attention to these issues, but the reality is uh, if you, where you put your attention, uh, then things actually start happening. And, and that was uh, so very, very positive on, on the broader environmental side, but also a sustainability in focus on the investment side. And that's why I put the picture of Hendrik to toy there a little earlier. He's now calling. Remember Hendrik's? Hendrik is the uh, chief executive of Investec, or co-chief executive of the whole Investec. They're going to be splitting it up into two units, and he'll be the uh, the boss of Investec Asset Management. And Investec Asset Management has got 150 billion U, uh, US, 150 billion pounds, I think, uh, under assets under management. So they're not the biggest, but they're a sizable uh, operation. And people listen in the city of London when Hendrik talks, because remember he started that company literally with his briefcase and that's where he be, how it all began and hendrick was saying that he believes and they, they're going to start pushing for activism in this front that you need an an, an ecg that's uh, environmental social and governance expert on every board of directors who is responsible for the company's ecg activities it's very very different to to even five years ago as he was saying where it was all about pr you know it's the soft stuff environmentalism yes we do the we do gooders and uh, and the ceo would leave and let uh, some junior employee go out and do some social responsibility nowadays uh, the license um, the, the social license to do business is really critical and ollie i mean you must have seen this this trend this trend towards uh, um, social responsibility uh, sustainability going mainstream in the business environment, given that the most people who do come to Davos are business leaders and guys like uh, Polman from Unilever, who in the past was seen as a little bit, uh, a little bit out there, is now very, very mainstream. I can indeed. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's great. I mean, um, the, the example you gave is a, is a fascinating one, a really strong example. It was, it was my headline. <laughs> Not wishing to brag, 
five, three years ago, I believe it was, in 2016, so four years ago, um, when we called out the fact that there would be, by 2050, if we're not careful, more plastic than fish in the oceans. And we started that debate in Davos. It's, I noticed it was there were advertising hoardings and, and, and slogans and on the streets of Davos this year. For us, in terms of raising attention and profile, it's a very strong headline. It was actually a statistic buried, buried, very deep within the report. We only found it the night before we were due to launch the, the, the publication. But it, it rightly caught people's imaginations and, and woke people up to that fact. Um, we, we, we keep having a kind of internal competition to come up the next the next major campaign that will be as successful. I think my one this year was that we we um, we put out a report and in fact announced a, 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 um, a, co a collaboration in Nigeria aimed at improving the way we deal with e-waste. So for example, you may not know, but there are 10 times, there's 10, 10 times as much, or even 100 times in fact, I'm just looking at my notes, 100 times as much gold ore in e-waste than gold than there is in ore you mine from the ground. So it's a tremendous opportunity, not just to, not just to extract gold more efficiently from than you would in the ground, but also to deliver much better sustainability, much better environment, and remove health hazards. We, in Nigeria alone, for 100,000 people um, that work trying to informally um, you know, recoup some of these precious metals that we're throwing away on a, on a, on a daily basis. I believe the average European um, throws away half their body weight in electronic waste each year. So it's a scandalously um, serious problem. And yet, the way we like to see challenges is to turn them into opportunities. And I think we've done that this year with electronic waste. One to watch. It's just very briefly on the business side, just on the business side, I just want to mention our climate CEOs. I'm 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 not sure because I don't have a list in front of me whether Investec is one of them, but we have a really vibrant community of CEOs that have signed up to um, make commitments to to um, honour and, and draw us towards and support the Paris climate goals of reducing carbon emissions. And we've seen some great work by people in banks such as ING that are now refusing to lend. Um, infrastructure finance to companies that use um, coal as a, a broad part of our energy mix. So we've seen some really creative um, initiatives on the part of business to actually, you know, see this, um, see this sustainability not as, as you say, not as 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 a, as a PR wheeze, but as something which is actually core to their business. I'm sure Investec will be there because Hendrik was telling us very proudly how he's on the WEF's uh, sustainability uh, grouping that he's involved. He will be in that case. He he will be. Uh, yeah, something that that uh, David Attenborough, Sir David Attenborough, was uh, saying that that really uh, resonated with me um, was he told the story of the sea otter and how because and this is a hundred years ago how sea otters had the had the uh, the finest coats and as a consequence the wealthy people of Europe wanted to wear sea otters so they uh, the incentive uh, was to hunt them down and. As a consequence of the area where the sea otters used to live, uh, they they started being hunted out. But worse than that, the fish disappeared. And he explained that the reason for that was that the sea otters would eat the sea urchins, and the sea urchins would eat the uh, would eat the uh, some other micro micro uh, marine animal, um, and that would then be. Uh, be the area where the fish would be laying their eggs. Now, because the the sea otters weren't eating the sea urchins, there were too many um, there were too many sea urchins around. They were eating too many <laughs> of this other micro uh, animal, and as a consequence, the fish didn't have anywhere to lay their eggs, and so forth. So there were no there were much less fish in the area. Just using that as an example, how everything is inter intertwined and interled, and the WEF really works hard on making those connections and, and just educating people to understand that. Uh, one last point on waste, uh, which Oli brought up, was uh, Satya Nadella, who is really growing in stature, the chief executive of Microsoft, who was one of the co-chairs this year with a whole lot of young people, which was a lovely innovation. But he made the point that in the United States of America, as rich as it is, there's still 40 million people who go uh, who, who are or go without food. Uh, every day, one sixth of the population. Yet, there's 40% of the food that is produced is thrown into waste. So there's lots and lots of work to be done to to sort out all of that. That's sustainability. It's now front and center. It's something that you need to be aware of uh, in your investments because the less sustainable businesses, says Hendrik Dutoy, who should know these things given the the uh, the work he's done on 
on uh, investment analysis, the less sustainable businesses are the poorer performers. So if you find a business that is uh, that ranks high on sustainability or on those ESG goals, uh, then you will be almost certainly um, be outperforming other companies with their investments. So that's the the first one. The second point, uh, the second area I'm going to talk about is is this one. And make a note, please, of this name. Uh, this lady, uh, Mariana Mazzucatu, is a uh, one of the stars of Davos, uh, one of the uh, up and up and coming economists. She had uh, quite a few, quite a lot of attention in various sessions on her, but by none more, none greater than the South African delegation. Now, at the on the uh, Wednesday evening every year, Brand South Africa hosts a dinner uh, at which uh, it invites primarily uh, the 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 leading uh, South African uh, delegation there and um, international guests. Every year up until this year, I've cracked an invite and it's been easy to get a seat and all's been well. This year, because of the interest, um, I had to kind of wait at the door <laughs> and make sure so that if, if somebody didn't arrive, uh, then only then could I get a, a seat at the table, which really is fantastically good news. Uh, as it happens, I ended um, between uh, or opposite Abraham Patel, who, as I mentioned earlier, I'd known for a long time and, and had a fascinating conversation with him. But uh, one from Pravin Gordon. So there was he was sitting two seats away and there was um, a, a seat between us. And he said to me, now he'd been keeping the seat for Mariana Mazukatu, who then duly arrived. Abraham told me, uh, uh, sorry, the Minister of Economic uh, Affairs, um, told me that he and and Pravin Gordon had been discussing uh, her books, and in fact uh, they'd they'd been reading this and looking at her new ideas, and they're completely enthralled by them. Uh, the president came up later to come and have a little chat to her as well, uh, and um, he was also very excited about having met her. So, if you want to learn about where South Africa is likely to be going in its economic policy. Read her books. She's got two of them. And um, Oli, I don't know if you've come across her or if you had much to do with um, Mariana uh, in the in the build-up to Davos or in, in any of the sessions. Yeah, I do. I, I'm a huge fan of hers. Of hers and everything we are in, we are as an organisation. She's a, she's a, a good example. You mentioned earlier. How do we how do we decide who to who to bring to the meeting when we can only bring 3,000 people? They've all got to be. They've all got to be at the top of their game. Um, Mariana, we've been um, courting, I think, frankly, for a, a couple of years. Th this year, last year rather, um, we invited her onto our, our, our global future councils on economic progress. This is the. These are the folks that go to Dubai in November, and I actually moderated a session with her in um, in Dubai, uh, which is available on our website about the jobs, about the risk of jobs and skills in the future. And she's such a refreshing voice. Um, so I'm really glad I missed all of her sessions uh, this year um, in Davos. But I did, as I say, meet her in Dubai. And I'm really glad that she's continuing to make an impact because I think it's a sign that, you know, more and more we're, we're, we realize that you know, market economics does need to change. You do need sometimes, you need new approaches, sometimes radical new approaches to um, solving really chronic challenges. I think she's one of those voices that, that kind of nails it. Well, the South African delegation agrees with you. Uh, I, I, I cannot believe that uh, the, or certainly the, the reaction to her uh, was extremely positive and they couldn't speak highly enough of her and her views. So for South Africans who are wondering about the direction that the economy is going to take in future, and I must tell you that after this, this meeting, and last year I was positive, this meeting, this year's meeting, uh, I'm really positive, and I think that's probably part of uh, understanding that, of course, there's a mountain to climb, and there's nine years of of chaos that that the country has to unravel or, or get beyond. But the the right people are in the right places and doing the right kind of thinking, and it's lovely to hear from Oli that uh, that Mariana Mazzucato is is so highly respected uh, by the World Economic Forum as well. So there we go. You've got two books to to read. I'm going to be consuming them and uh, hopefully having an interview with her in the not too distant future here in London. Very charming, uh, very charming uh, economist. 
and it was a, a true delight to meet with her. As far as the South African delegation is concerned, they really did make another good impact. Uh, the Zimbabweans, unfortunately, uh, kind of slid off the uh, the front pages, if you like. Last year, Zimbabwe and South Africa were uh, both uh, in being well courted by international investors. Uh, the chaos in Zimbabwe has um, differentiated the two countries quite significantly. But from the South African point of view, we had a, uh, a, a president who continues to just grow in confidence. Uh, there were various meetings uh, that, that I attended where he was engaging with South Africans and with, uh, with, with foreign investors. You need to get both parties. You need to get the business uh, investing as well as uh, foreigners as well. It's almost like they take their lead from what's going on in South Africa itself. And there you could see that that he certainly has won over uh, the South Africans. Uh, as far as the uh, international plan or that plan of 100 billion uh, to be raised in five years, uh, last year, they, they're very proudly, um, Rob Davies very proudly uh, said at one of the uh, sessions, I think it was at a press conference, that South Africa was one of the few countries in the world where foreign investment, in fact, went up last year. They used a figure of 400 odd percent. It went, according to UNCTAG, part of the United Nations, uh, direct investment into South Africa rose from 1.3 billion in the last year of Zuma to 7.3 billion in the first year of Ramaphosa. So if you ever uh, doubted that, that was a, a transformative event at uh, NASREC in December 2017, well, there it is. Uh, the Of that amount, 4.9, call it 5 billion, two thirds was invested into independent power producers. So the one area where uh, the Zuma administration was not able to completely mess things up or one of the areas they weren't able to mess up was in the uh, the IPPs although they did put the whole IPPs on hold for two years when uh, Ramaphosa came in and appointed uh, Jeff Khadebe as the Minister of Energy it took him I think all of three days to unlock that uh, logjam and now it uh, South Africa is looking very good as far as uh, independent power producers are concerned. So that's that's a, a, an area of excellence. Uh, Ramaphosa said that the uh, problems that had been caused in uh, the logjam on, uh, on regulation or uh, policy, the way he described it, he said that the, the uh, policy seemed to have been made on the hoof, as it were, in certain cases. And we know from the energy policy, that certainly is the case. He said that is now as uh, being addressed and the focus areas there on mining tourism telecoms and energy uh, very he was brutally honest as well he said that south africa had lost its way in another conversation maria ramos was saying that it's just been a horrible nine years so it was almost like south africa was saying or the south african delegation was saying look we we, we really were out of step uh, for the last nine years but we're determined to fix it to do the right things and to move in the right direction. And I think anybody who's looking at the future of any country uh, and and when you stack up that kind of a message, it's hard uh, not to give uh, the those, if they have credibility, the benefit of the doubt. And we're seeing that increasingly. So 20 billion of the 100 billion uh, has been committed already, the 100 billion dollars that is, uh, in fixed investment into South Africa. Uh, uh, the president uh, Ramaphosa did announce that there's going to be another um, summit later this year, investment summit, and I think it's probably going to be around the time that the Africa, uh, the WEF Africa summit is. Oli, is that uh, scheduled for September? Yeah, it is. Yeah, um, I haven't got the dates in front of me, but yes, it is September. So hopefully, we'll be able to um, we'll be able to hang around for both. I'd love to. And and uh, there was a little bit of a hiatus in the. Uh, in the Africa summits, is is it now back on the calendar? Will it be every year again? Good, good question. So we had a um, we had a shift back a year ago. We we always have these kind of reflections where we try to do things differently. We just break things up a little bit. And I I think at the time we decided regional meetings, not just in Africa but everywhere, East Asia, Latin America, Middle East, North Africa. We moved to a, a biannual model. And I think sometimes you know we feel just as everybody everybody else does that sometimes there's too much talk and not enough action so I, I think I think the the rationale was that we wanted to give a little bit more time for the action to catch up with the words it seemed to make a lot of sense um, 
we, as, as you know, it doesn't mean that we're no less committed to, to, to Africa or other regions, but especially Africa. We had a, a dialogue with President Ramaphosa in June last year. I was very happy to be able to um, be there for that, and it was a very high-impact meeting, although just aimed at CEOs, so there were only 100 people in the room. This year, of course, we're going to be in Cape Town for our regular one. The interesting thing I've noticed is that not only is um, are more parts of my organization engaged in work in Africa than any other region in the world, but I've also noticed that since, since I joined in 2012, there's been a steady uptick in the size and scale of the Africa meeting. It is now our largest regional meeting, and it was um, it, that was not the case. It was kind of third or fourth in, in 2012. So there's huge amounts of interest. Who knows where we'll be next year? There has been talk, and I'm sure you would have noticed um, that we may be going to Ethiopia in um, in 2020. And personally, I don't think that that would be a bad thing at all. Yeah, the president of Ethiopia was mentioned in the Financial Times of London this morning uh, as being one of the two stars of Davos this year. So uh, nice to see that he's getting the recognition for some incredibly radical economic transformation that's going on in that country. Who knows? Maybe next year they're going to be saying the same thing about South Africa. So South Africa on track. Uh, if you had been there and engaged with the caliber of the people who are leading this country now, uh, you could not uh, have thought any differently. It's lovely to know, as, as Ollie says, that the WEF will be uh, back again with the Cape Town meeting uh, this year. Uh, on to the, uh, the final uh, subject or the final area. And uh, our partners at the Wall Street Journal um, invited me to come along to, uh, to the organization. They hold almost like they have a parallel uh, uh, program going at the same time that the WEF program is going on. And it was good to be able to uh, to go and shake hands with with people who uh, I've gotten to know over the past uh, year or so that we've we've been partners, and this was a a highlight for me. Um, Mr. Lee Kaifu Lee is the former head of Google in China, and that book is well worth uh, acquiring. You can get it on Amazon or on on, on Kindle. I'm not sure that you'd you'd get it in the in the bookshops in South Africa, but it certainly is available on Kindle. And he is, uh, uh, he was full value. This, they called it the, the chief executives book club. And they had him there talking about uh, AI, artificial intelligence. And I guess you can imagine he comes with a huge pedigree. He's a, a professor at, at uh, business schools and, and as I say, formerly head of Google in China. Uh, and he had some really interesting things to say on the fact that it's a war, artificial intelligence, in his opinion, between the US and China with everybody else nowhere. Uh, and the reason for that is it really, there, there are two things that determine who the winners are going to be on the artificial intelligence side. The one is the amount of research that you put into it. And there, the Americans outspend China 11 to 1. The other, the rocket fuel, as he says, is the data that you get. Now, you can imagine you've, you've got to, you, you've got to, you build it. And there, America has got the uh, advantage, uh, Silicon Valley being the obvious uh, pointer to that. But on the other hand, the data uh, is where China has the advantage. And it, it was quite interesting for him to say it's very hard to work out who's going to win of the two of them because the Chinese have the advantage of its entrepreneurs who supercharged. And we know that. We know that the Chinese people, perhaps because of where they come from, um, are – a lot more focused and a lot harder working than than people in the West. Uh, you only just have to look at the the way uh, people are educated or the, the the investment in education. My daughter is teaching in South Korea. It's obviously not China, but in South Korea at the moment, and uh, she's she's teaching English there, and she's been blown away by the by the the stage that people start learning. I.e., they're almost toddlers, and they're they're in there learning English right up until the hours that they work that they come in to learn. There's a hunger, a bit like South Africa in many ways, a hunger for education amongst the population. So those are the the, the countries that, according to Mr. Lee, are going to be uh, the winners into the future. But the question was raised, uh, okay, let's get practical. Now, what about autonomous vehicles? In other words, driverless cars. Who do you think is going to be first, America or China? And he said it's, it's, it's likely that China will be the first ones to use driverless cars cars in a in a grand scale because china will put down smart highways where only driverless cars could go but it's unlikely he said that you're going to see driverless cars uh, down in the middle of shanghai or any of the other cities in china so america will have the technological advantage and probably 
be using things like that uh, at a deeper level, whereas China um, has the has the mass production advantage. So it was just really interesting. But generally speaking, artificial intelligence tech, huge, huge theme again on uh, this year. One of the points that, that came out, and in fact, uh, my interview with Chris Becker, and I'd urge you to go and listen to that. He was amazing. Uh, look, he is the chairman of, of NASPERS, and he's, uh, it's through his efforts that NASPERS is now 20% of the entire Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Can you believe that? I mean, a company that comes from a backwater because of this incredible entrepreneur who had a very good slice of luck, I guess, uh, he would be um, well. He he would be the first to admit it. I think others would say yes. You got to you got to make the bets to be able to win the bets. Um, in investing in Tencent when there were only thirty people as a small little business in Hong Kong, and now Tencent being one of the top, certainly one of the top ten internet companies on earth. Uh, and Chris Becker was uh, was pointing out that isn't it interesting that in the last year Facebook uh, had come under a lot of pressure. I know that they cancelled one of their big appointments. Uh, I, I went to an event there two years ago where Charles Sandberg was around. I don't think Zuckerberg has been to Davos for a while, but uh, certainly the COO Sandberg was there. This year, uh, the person who was supposed to have, have hosted one of the events that I was invited to couldn't come anymore. So it's, and, and what Chris was saying was that in years gone by, uh, Facebook has, it, it books out this this huge uh, um, uh, position on the promenade or the main road, the high street of Davos. And this year, the branding was tiny. And in the window, there was no branding whatsoever. So it's, it's interesting to see how things change. Talking about that uh, on the promenade, a little bit further down from where Facebook was, and certainly no way that you could have missed the branding, was APSA. It's the first time ever that a South African company has had a, a presence of that of that size uh, in the informal kind of marketing area of uh, Davos. And that was, that was quite exciting to see. So artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles, uh, data, the fight there between, uh, between uh, China and, and, uh, and the US. On the technology side, the belief that uh, the regulators are going to start coming uh, after Google, Facebook, Amazon, uh, to a larger degree than they did in the past, uh, particularly Google, which has just got another, almost almost on cue, another 5 billion euro fine this time, and it's being sued in uh, in Germany by Axel Springer uh, for abuse of content and so on. It's a fascinating area, but you can't continue in the duopoly that, that Google and Facebook have had on, on online advertising indefinitely at some point in time. The regulators do come back to the party. Before I, I bring Ollie in again, I just want to give you some of the uh, just a little uh, collage there of uh, some of my uh, individual highlights. There's Chris Becker, uh, top left hand side. I would also urge you to go and listen to the Popo Malefi interview. Popo is the uh, former uh, uh, premier of the Northwest Province who has been standing strong against corruption. He's currently the chairman of Transnet. And the interview, if you ever doubt that the corrupt are going to be nailed, uh, listen to Popo's uh, view on it. He's talking about um, using the South Africa using the extradition treaty with Dubai to bring back the Guptas to stand in front of the courts. Uh, it, it really is is something that it's, I would just urge you to, to uh, you'd, be, you'd be very heartening. There's a lot of people in South Africa who say, yes, but no one's gone to jail yet. Uh, the, re the retort to that is watch the space. Uh, next to him, um, we have the two scientists uh, on aging. Konstantinos um, uh, uh, Demetrios, uh, who's one of the, uh, he runs one of the units of the Max Planck Institute, which is one of the uh, great scientific institutions in the world. And then, as mentioned earlier, so, uh, sorry, Dame Linda Partridge. Uh, both of those interviews, if you're interested in the science of aging, are, are great. On the left-hand side, the uh, I do this every year. I talk to the joint CEOs of Sassel. And, uh, you know, it's so good to see these guys, uh, Steve Cornell and uh, Bongani and Nkwababa. Uh, they just are friends. They, they're, uh, one often hears the story that joint chief executives don't work. Well, these two guys have been together now for three years. And, you, you know, it's the informal things that you see in Davos, uh, the two of them sitting together. Not because they have to, but because they want to. Uh, swapping notes, chatting. You can see that they really are good pals, and it comes across in, in the interview I had with them. The inimitable 
Adrian Gore. I mean, he really is an extraordinary human being. Uh, 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 unfortunately, the what's it? They say missionaries are not always fully appreciated in their homelands. But the last time I saw Adrian was um, in London, where he was uh, engaged or, or releasing a challenge that he and partners are going to be doing to change 100 million lives in the next five years, 100 million lives, and uh, supported there by Apple, you know, the chief operating officer of Apple talking. You had the um, uh, the, the uh, British uh, Minister of Health uh, uh, also is saying how uh, dis or Discovery, which is known in, in the UK as Vitality, is working closely now with the national uh, with NHI, um, sorry, the National Health uh, uh, NHS rather here in the UK to to go towards preventative um, medicine and and Adrian is just really keen as always in promoting South Africa. Both he and Stephen Kossif from Investec, uh, who's sitting next to him, mentioned uh, will put a figure on the cost of the Zuma years, um, and they put it down to a trillion rand, uh, the lost in lost GDP, and that was a uh, if you start thinking how that one trillion rand could have been invested differently or could have been applied differently, I mean, a lot more people uh, who'd be working. But both of those interviews are well worth picking up as well. And then uh, a gentleman uh, there uh, called Mohammed Hassan. He was one of the co-chairs. I, I bumped into him. I watched him on the stage, but I bumped into him afterwards and had a, con had a, 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 con a chat with him. He's from a refugee camp in Kenya. He's, uh, he's a he comes from Somalia. His parents were killed uh, early on. Uh, he's been in that refugee camp for 18 years, and he is a activist to try and make sure that others uh, don't have to go through another 18 years. The problem with the refugee camps, and, and this is what Davos does so well, it, it highlights not just uh, the good things that are happening or the, the difficulties that we're seeing on a big stage, but it highlights human tragedies like this. And he, is, he was given a voice. He was given a platform. And I hope a lot of people listen. And then finally, on the right-hand side, uh, just a little story. That's Samantha. Uh, Samantha works for uh, a company called Liquid Chef. It's a South African company. They've been involved in doing catering in Davos now for 11 years. This year, they brought in 85 people, and they did 42 events. And pretty much each, all the high-profile events that you went to behind the bar or, or serving the drinks or making the food were a whole bunch of South Africans. Uh, and that is liquid chefs who uh, are just, uh, well, they've become, the, in fact, uh, Adam uh, Solomon, who's the, the founder of the company, said to me they doubled in size this year. So it's lovely to see a South African, uh, a proudly South African operation doing as well as they're doing. Just, uh, Oli, uh, uh, we, we're kind of running out of time, but I'd love to get your thoughts on Mohammed and, and, and how you would find someone like that to come in as a co-chair. Uh, well, that's a really good question. Um, so as you know, we're, 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 we're kind of, we're a 365 outfit. One of the more interesting, but perhaps lesser known communities that we, that we kind of incubate at the forum is the, are the young global leaders. Um, these, this has a very grand um, title. Basically, the, the criteria are you've got to be between the ages of 30 and 40 and, and be brilliant. So um, um, Emmanuel Macron is a young global leader, for example. So Jacinda Ardern is a young global leader. Louis Pugh, who you just mentioned, is also a young global leader. He may be an alumni now, I'm not quite sure, but he's always been very, very involved um, with us, a really committed member of that community. We, we're, we're great fans of his. Um, one of the, one of the um, uh, initiatives that the young global leaders in, in uh, embarked upon during the summer was a trip to Kukuma refugee camp in, in Kenya, northern Kenya. It's the world's largest refugee camp, I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and the idea was to see if they could come up with some interesting ideas or solutions as to how they can make life a little bit better. And I actually found quite a thriving um, local economy. It, it became a growth hole for, the, for, the, for, the, for a wider area within northern Kenya. Uh, and they were quite impressed by that. And a lot of them, um, a number of the young global leaders went, came, came, have come back from there and have kind of initiated coding programs for people. Mohammed was from Kukuma himself. We brought him over. Um, we also brought over uh, a very talented young filmmaker who worked with us in our video team during the meeting from Kukuma as well. We're going to try to hire him for, for other events. I mean, he was amazing. 
So um, I guess it's a bit of the soft power of the WEF in terms of you're getting our using our ability to to work with the Swiss authorities to arrange visas on short notice. But it kind of goes back to what we're always trying to do, which is try to find new, fresh, creative solutions to, to problems. And and seeing who who out there is is so good and so talented, they really deserve a bigger stage. Fantastic. And he, and what a, a, a wonderful young man who has got all of the credentials to study anywhere. Uh, his problem is he just can't get the money to do it. And I'm going to close off with this picture. I know, Stu, you've, you've got a few questions. And uh, if, if you have questions to ask Ollie uh, or myself, um, please just uh, type them in there and, and, and Stuart will relay them. But I love this picture. This is, again, there it is, Beadle, uh, Greg Beadle. You said earlier, Ollie, isn't he an exceptional photographer? Well, I just love this. This is the best picture that I've seen of Cyril Ramaphosa ever. And uh, uh, even though he has a punishing schedule, he, he mentioned in the one evening that he'd been woken up at 5.30 a.m. by the National Union of Mine Workers who wanted to know what's going on at Eskom. And uh, having been a, an alumni, that was previously where he, he uh, obviously made his name was at the NUM, uh, he has given them an open line to him. So he was talking to, the, to Norman South Africa at 5.30, and I know the night before, He'd been out at uh, entertaining or hosting the South African event, which only finished pretty late, and it takes a while to get around things. Yet he was there. He was he was driven by uh, high energy, and uh, was uh, made a made a huge impression. I sometimes wish that I could take the the cynics um, in South Africa and just just plant them in Davos for a couple of days and just see how. Uh, someone like Ramaphosa can can play on a major stage and and does it so well. Stu, uh, would you like to just pose those questions? I see there there are a few. Hi, Alex. Thanks a lot. Yes, there's two of them. Uh, there's one from Peter. He just wants to know what are the risks of nationalising the South African Reserve Bank. That was an interesting point. It was discussed, uh, and the nationalisation of the South African Reserve Bank, in fact, would align it with what happens in other countries in the world. Uh, it's so funny when you are isolated by the tyranny of distance, you don't realize always that the uh, the reality of of, uh, of 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 what has been perpetrated in South Africa, for instance, we were the only country in the world, in the world, where the mineral rights were not owned by the state uh, until 19, post-1994. And that was a heritage of colonialism where the mineral rights, of course, during colonialism were owned by very rich people in London. Uh, that's a that's kind of a, a consequence. The South African Reserve Bank is a private institution. Uh, at the moment, it's got shareholders. So the idea is to try and align that with global best practices. It's, it doesn't mean that suddenly the Reserve Bank is going to be uh, creating money. Uh, anybody who's met the Secha Hanyahu and seen how he stood up against Zuma and his cronies will realize that he's no pushover. Excellent. Thanks, Alec. Uh, just a, there's a global question here from EJ. He wants to know how will the Chinese dominance affect the dollar in the future, and will it still be used as a universal currency? Ollie, have you got any thoughts on that? Ah, what, a, what a good question. I'm not an economist. Uh, I'm not. I'm not particularly expert in finance. We did look at whether we d whether to hold a session on um, the rise of other reserve currencies, and we decided to we decided to drop it. We just didn't think there was a huge amount of interest there. Um, instead, we decided to focus on um, the, 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 the kind of debt crisis, the looming debt crisis that we see. So, um, you know, which is all dollar denominated. So instead, we kind of focus on the fact that if you take into account business, cor corporate government and household debt, we're in a much worse place than we are in 2008. So that was our kind of focus. Whether um, the dollar's domination is going to continue, but it's very questionable. And again, I don't want to go beyond my um, kind of very strict confines of, of, of amateur kind of uh, economics here. I suspect that is going to be called, called into question, but perhaps not, not anytime soon. We didn't hear a huge amount of interest to discuss this subject this year. Mm. The reserve currency does give the United States a huge advantage, but as Ollie says, it's it's just a matter of time. But will that time be 50 years uh, before there's a an alternative uh, reserve currency? Who knows? Uh, but if you've got 1.3 billion people in China, and they're growing at the rates that they are, and you've got three 320 odd million people in the U in the US, at some point in time there has to be a, a switch over. Of course, Donald Trump wants that to be much later rather than sooner. 
I think just on, on that note, what we are seeing, and this, this goes back to the theme of the meeting about the, the global architecture, I think one of the points that we wanted to get across was that the Bretton Woods institutions, IMF, World Bank, etc., they're, they're, they've done a great job, an amazing job. 70 years ago, they didn't have to deal with climate change, fourth industrial revolution, shifting geopolitical um, balance of power, etc. There is a new breed of multilateral organizations, the Asian, um, the Asian infrastructure, um, bank, the AIDB, um, of which I, I believe that's the name of which South Africa is a member, the BRICS Bank, um, the New Development Bank. The, the, there is a new emerging international architecture, and that is going to kind of, yeah, radically kind of change the the the, the, the way that we that we kind of seek to achieve multilateral governance. Stu, more questions? Uh, no, Alec, we've just had two questions today, unfortunately. So that's it from our side. Okay, it says six on my screen, but maybe that's people commenting and saying, hey, get rid of these guys now. <laughs> you've, you've, had, you've, you've had a few compliments, I have to say, but there are yeah, no questions from that. Oh, good. Oh, well, well done, Ollie. Thanks very much for joining us today. You really did add uh, a completely different dimension to the normal feedback, and uh, I wish I could take you on my roadshow around South Africa, but I guess uh, Klaus Schwab wouldn't be too happy to, <laughs> to hear that, although... So you wouldn't mind going to a little bit of sunshine? <laughs> I'd love to join you too. Exactly, perfect, perfect time of year. I will be in South Africa in March, early first week of March. So maybe we can we can hook up if you're around then. Fabulous. Thanks, Ollie. Really appreciate uh, your your um, participation today, Stuart. As always, uh, well done in handling all the technical side on the on the back end. And thanks to everyone, all the Biz News community members, for coming along and hearing this feedback. It's a it it's an extraordinary event which provides uh, unique insights into the way the world is going. For me, as I, I, I close by saying, just look at that guy and imagine where the country could have been if there were, what was it, 170 votes difference on the uh, nearly 5,000 people who voted at the uh, at NASRAC December 2017. Someone was looking after us and, uh, well, don't, don't, um, don't, don't be daunted by the by the mountain that is needed to be climbed. Uh, the message is very clear. Yes, uh, we've messed up over the last nine years, but we appreciate it and we determined to go forward. Thanks again for being with us today. And for those of you who, who want to come along to the roadshow, uh, all those details are on Biz News. Cheerio for now. Thank you.